Hi, this is Katie with Katie Loves Classic Books, and today I'm here with my August wrap-up. So the first book, or this month, was a poetry collection. Now, if you follow my channel, I think you'll know that I tend to read one poetry collection each month. But this month I read two because I was in the middle of such a long book that I read a couple poetry collections to help get me through it. So the first one I read this month was Feminine Gospels by Carol Ann Duffy, and this was published in 2002. Now, Carol Ann Duffy is a Britain's Poet Laureate, and so that's kind of cool, and I see why, because I absolutely loved her poems. I gave this collection 5 out of 5 stars. So this collection follows different women and different aspects of women's lives from historical figures to more modern women and some more personal explorations. And yeah, I just thought this was beautiful and very clever and I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought it would. So I thought I'd talk about some of my favorite poems to give you an idea of what's in this collection. Uh, so the first poem that I loved in this collection was called The Long Queen, and it seems like it's about uh, Elizabeth I, and um, kind of because uh, she was the sworn virgin queen, how kind of about her lonely life and how she was the queen of all like girls and females and all their experiences. And I quite like that poem. And then there's one called Beautiful that was about uh, Helen of Troy, Cleopatra, Marilyn Monroe, and Princess Diana and how their beauty impacted their lives. And um, there was a poem called The Laughter of Stafford Girls High. And it was the longest poem in this collection. And I really liked it. It was about this all girls school. And one day all the girls start laughing and it catches on and they're all laughing and they can't stop. And every single day all they do is laugh and they wake each teacher up to their like inner desires. And before long the school is to shut down because the girls won't stop laughing and all the teachers are quitting to go and follow their dreams. And uh, I really liked that poem. And just all the characters and like kind of like the story behind it I suppose. And the writing of course. And then um, I feel like as the poems went on, it became more personal. And there's a poem called The Dreaming Week. And um, it was just from this woman's perspective um, about how she's busy all week because she's dreaming. So she goes through the days and she's like, no, not today, not tomorrow, not the day after because she's busy dreaming. And the language in that one was just really beautiful. I thought that was the most beautifully written. Um, there's another poem called The Light Gather, which is about a growing child and how filled with light it is, and I thought that was really beautiful. Um, there's another poem called, I think, Northwest, let's see, Northwest, and, uh, it was about a place where, like, our past exists and, like, all our unborn children and, and, uh, the graves of loves that didn't work out and stuff like that, and that was very poignant and uh, beautiful as well. Um, yeah, so those are all my favorite poems. And then there were two other ones I quite liked too. Uh, one called History, which is about a woman that actually is history. And, uh, and then there's another one called The Virgin's Memo. And I just thought that one was clever. Like it's not beautiful or anything like that, but it's clever and it stands out. And it's about a uh, virgin the Virgin Mary and she's telling her son what to keep and not to keep like I'll get rid of acne and asthma and all this and maybe rethink the giraffe and keep this and um, I don't know so it was just like this list I thought that was funny. Uh, Caroline Duffy likes like lists in general I feel like within her poems there will be little lists and that poem was like an entire uh, list in general but then there's like little mini lists within her poems and it's kind of an interesting little format she throws in there anyways yeah so beautiful and clever and uh, I just really enjoyed it and I do highly recommend this one the second book I finished this month was this beast of a book that took me just about the whole month to read and that is L'Amour d'Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory, and this was published in 1485. So Sir Thomas Mallory um, was a knight himself, it is believed, and he was imprisoned for something, and so while he was in prison, he uh, translated all these French 
works of the legends of King Arthur and just sort of um, compiled all these myths and legends of King Arthur into this one volume. And this is considered the classic rendition of King Arthur. This tells of King Arthur from his birth at the beginning and to his formation of Camelot and his marrying Guinevere and his forming the Round Table and acquiring all his knights. And then it tells of a bunch of his knights and their feats and accomplishments and their romances and then the eventual downfall of Camelot. Um, so this was written in Middle English. I got this version in particular. This is um, by the, the Modern Library because it's in one volume and it's unabridged and untranslated, which is what I wanted. Um, the only thing is, it's definitely not translated, like the phrasing and everything is totally the same, but the only thing that looks like has changed is some of the spelling does seem more modern, but then some of it doesn't, so maybe I'm wrong in assuming that, but it does seem like the spelling has changed. But this wasn't hard to read regardless. Um, yeah, I mean, this was hard to get through, but it was not difficult to read per se. So the beginning was interesting. It was interesting reading about King Arthur's birth and the sword and the stone. And at the beginning it was uh, when Merlin appeared, but then um, he wasn't in it anymore. Um, and that was interesting. And then the end was interesting with the downfall of Camelot and all the stuff about Lancelot and Guinevere. I really enjoyed that. But the middle section, and I mean a really large portion of this book, was rough to get through. Um, there were so many jousts. I can't even tell you how many joust scenes I've read now. Probably hundreds. I'm not even kidding. Um, yeah, and they were just very repetitive and hard, hard to get through. Um, in the middle section, there was like the whole romance and story about Sir Tristram and then his love while Beale Isoud. And, um, that was interesting because... I've heard a lot about their uh, romance. I didn't realize it was in here and then it was such a large portion and Sir Tristan was quite a big character. Um, Sir Lancelot and him were like the most important knights in Camelot. And so that was interesting. I enjoyed reading about him and that. And then there was the Holy Grail section too, which wasn't that long. That was interesting as well. But there was just this huge middle portion and um, it made me really drag reading this book because I just didn't really feel compelled to pick it up when I would, I would just get distracted, you know, so I'd set aside a couple hours to read, but then, you know, I'd keep spacing out or keep deciding to get up or something because it, it was not that interesting for a while. It was, it was not easy to get through, but I'm glad I have gone through it. I mean, uh, this is so interesting. I knew when I picked this up, I didn't pick this up, um, for the sake of like a fast paced, totally interesting read. It was more for its like historical significance. Um, like the legends of King Arthur, everyone knows about those. And it's interesting to read, you know, the most classic rendition of those. And um, yeah, I feel like this, these myths and these legends are so rooted in the, like the collective subconscious. And uh, this book has influenced a lot of future literature and uh, especially fantasy like you see in this like you see how it's impacted the genre of fantasy um, as it is today uh, you know I've been watching Game of Thrones lately I'm a big fan although I haven't read the books but I will eventually and uh, and you can see how this impacted that you can see similarities and, and so it's funny to see how much this has impacted fantasy um, yeah, so this is just, you know, it's one of those stories that is just so, um, so famous and rooted in our uh, collective subconscious, and it's uh, so important. So that's why I wanted to pick this up, and um, and while it was very tough to get there at times and kind of boring, although there were interesting parts, it was very interesting to read. So. I liked Arthur. He wasn't in it as much as I thought he would be. His knights were in it a lot more, like Sir Tristram and Sir Lancelot, I felt like, were much more prominent than he was. Um, 
but I liked him kind of. Uh, I think Sir Lancelot was my favorite man in this book. Um, and of course they make him out to be the best knight in the world and he's very chivalrous and all that, but he just seems the most noble like um, to his fellow knights and to women and to Guinevere. Like I actually really, like there's a lot of problematic stuff in here of course just because of the time period, but I actually did really like his love story with Guinevere. I actually quite fell for them at the end. Um, yeah, and he was loyal to her, you know, at least in his own mind. Um, but like Sir Tristram and Lampiel, I thought I was surprised because uh, they're the second big romance, but at times I just wasn't feeling it. Like, uh, Sir Tristram ended up with some other ladies sometimes. I was like, oh, I forgot about her. Um, so you can't really like it quite as much. But Sir Lancelot was very, very loyal and just um, seemed like a wonderful knight, a wonderful friend, and a loyal lover. And so I, I really liked him, and I liked his love story with Guinevere. Um, it's interesting, the relationships in here, because... Um, the two big romances and a lot of other relationships as well are adulterous in, in nature. You know, they're, they're married to other people, uh, the females. And it seems championed for a lot of the book, like uh, Sir Thomas Mallory, you know, is saying love is a wonderful thing. Besides the Holy Grail part, there's a little bit of repenting of some of those actions in that part, but then it goes right back to like, oh, love is important. And it's interesting because by modern standards, you know, it's like, wow, well, that's adultery, you know? But it's interesting to think about the time period this was written because, um, and it's set in because it's set a lot earlier than the 15th century because this was written in the 15th century. But I think these legends, you know, are supposed to be set in like the 5th or 6th century, century, something like that. And so um, a lot of marriage back then was really just for financial reasons and for reasons of power um, and stuff like that. Um, and so I think it was natural. It's like, well, if you want love, then a lot of people having, uh, you know, affairs and whatnot. But that doesn't mean there aren't consequences because even if, like, that's somewhat normal and everyone else thinks, okay, if the spouse is being cheated on, it's, you know, there are harsh consequences for that. Um, and Guinevere's almost burned at the stake at the end. So there are consequences for that. But yet, it seems like if you wanted a love union, union back then, that was kind of the way it was happening. So it's interesting to look at this in like a context of the time period um, and their relationships and whatnot. So that was interesting. From that, um, you can very much tell this is a product of its time. Like you can see back then, you know, the patriarchy was at its height, but yet we're still living in a patriarchal society. So you see like where some of the values have come from because it's in here and I'm not saying that's like good or the way things should be anymore, but it's just, you see where it's come from and uh, how it was. And it's interesting, um, you know, um, it's all about uh, the masculinity and, and all of that. Oh, there, was, there were some good things in the code of the round table. Um, not everyone upheld those things, you know, but they're supposed to at least be loyal to each other and uh, they're never supposed to hurt a woman. So even though women were very repressed, I guess that's good. Not all of them followed that, you know, but they're trying to protect them. And, you know, chivalry was at its height. And in some cases, you know, in some circumstances, that's fine. And others, not so much. Yeah, definitely the females. It was interesting to consider females in this time. Just, you know, like I said, the patriarchy was super at its height. So women, of course, were quite repressed and very much thought of as objects. And there were lots of damsels in distress and all that, which was kind of funny. Um, but there were a few powerful women in here, like Morgan Le Fay. She's the bit. Then they're like evil sorceresses. And uh, I don't know. It's interesting to consider her character kind of. And it's interesting because at the end when uh, 
King Arthur finds out about Guinevere and Lancelot, and I'm assuming this is not a spoiler because they're like everybody knows about Guinevere and Lancelot and all of that. Like I said, these stories are just they're part of our culture. And uh, so when King Arthur finds out about Guinevere and Lancelot, he says he's more sad to lose Lancelot than Guinevere because like, eh, I can find another queen. You know, when he blows it off as if she's not important, she's just a woman, he can go find another one. And I found it interesting that he blew her off like that and, you know, thinks women are not so important because it's like, well, the entirety of Camelot fell apart because of a woman, because of Guinevere. You know, if it wasn't for her, and because King Arthur felt so betrayed and because Lancelot was so in love with her, um, Camelot wouldn't have been destroyed. So it's like they try to make it seem like women are not important, but then it's funny because because of a woman the entire kingdom is destroyed. It reminded me very much of Helen of Troy in uh, Greek stories and whatnot. So, so yeah, so that's kind of interesting to think about some of the gender and just uh, gender issues and... Uh, just the ways of the times, you know. Um, yeah, so this was very interesting, but tough to get through, not gonna lie. So I gave this three out of five stars on Goodreads, but I'm very glad to have read it now. And I've been watching adaptations, which is really fun. Um, yeah, I saw Tristam and Isolde, which has James Franco in it, I believe, came out like, I don't know, a few years. Well, maybe not a few years ago now, maybe early 2000s or something. That was pretty good. I watched The Holy Grail, which I haven't seen in forever, and that was kind of funny. A very loose adaptation, but yet made fun of some of the things. Um, and here I watched the musical Camelot from the 60s. That was enjoyable, minus Lancelot had this super horrible, phony French accent. And I watched this one from the 50s, which I do not recommend. I had to stop watching it. It was ridiculous. Um, anyway, so, but it's been fun watching adaptations and stuff like that, and, uh, yeah, so if you have the guts, this is interesting, and I do recommend it, but it's not for the faint of heart or for those that, like, can't stick things through to the end, because it is hard to read, but if you have interest, you know, it's, it's fascinating. So that was that. The third book I completed this month was my second poetry collection. And that is The Midway Iterations by T.A. Noonan, and this was published in 2015, and I gave this 3 out of 5 stars. Um, this is published by the small independent poetry press called Hyacinth Girl Press. I'm pretty into reading um, poetry from these little small presses. This is the second one I've read from the press, but not my favorite. I will link this though in the description box below if you are interested, because you can only purchase it on their website. Anyway, so this is about the author driving to or from Florida, which is where she lives, and she's discussing kind of her experiences in Florida and her relationship to Florida um, and stuff like that. Um, in the first poem, the whole collection is kind of based on the first poem. She's stuck in traffic, and she's driving from Florida, and it seems like she could have almost died. And so each of the subsequent poems, um, take their titles from each line in the first poem, so until we finish the poem, basically. And so I had to look up, uh, like I was curious what the title meant, and so I realized Midway is a place in Florida, so that's where the Midway comes from. And I looked up iterations, and, it, and it's some sort of thing, like an experiment or something, and it's like very repetitive, and you get closer and closer to the desired result, and like, um, and that's what iterations are. And so this is what the uh, this collection seems like because, like I said, we have one poem and then each of the next poems uh, take their titles from the first poem, so they're in that way they're kind of repetitive, and then at the end, like the last poem, she kind of explains in that one what she was doing a little bit, so I guess that's where the iterations comes from. And so I thought the structure was interesting in that way, you know, it was kind of clever, I always like it when people are clever. And so I appreciated it for that, and poems were alright, but I didn't really emotionally connect to it. It wasn't absolutely beautiful. It wasn't anything crazy fabulous. So it was clever, like it was good. Um, nothing crazy. It was just kind of okay for me. So if it still like strikes your fancy, you can check it out. But you know, I'm not like highly recommending. 
this one um, I've read The Exhibit by Lauren Eager Crow by the same press and I recommend that one more but I'll keep checking out things from their press and see um, whether I like it or not. I'm not going to lie um, when you're on these presses websites like it's so hard to find out anything about the collection like unless somebody else has happened to you know put it in a video review or in reviews on Goodreads it's hard to tell because usually the description on Goodreads won't have a description and neither will the website it'll just have a, a snippet of a poem so I couldn't tell anything from this one and this one wasn't recommended by anyone in particular I I just liked the other collection I read by this press I'm not going to lie I did think this cover was pretty cool so you can see it there, it's pretty cool. And so maybe I was persuaded to read this one based on the cover. But yeah, so it was okay. It was kind of clever. Nothing special. The last book I read this month was The Sound of Waves by Yukio Mishima, who was a Japanese author. And this was published in 1954. So this follows a young man named Shinji and kind of his coming of age and how he falls in love for the first time with a girl named Hatsu. And uh, they live on this island in Japan, a fictional island I discovered called Utajima. And it's very tiny and everyone there makes their living from the sea, uh, Shinji included. He is a fisherman. And at first um, the islanders start a lot of gossip and it kind of threatens their young relationship and then it seems like the tides might turn in their favor and uh yeah this i gave this five out of five stars this was such a lovely book um it was a very sweet tale you know of coming of age and young romance and the trials and tribulations of that um and it was just kind of a quiet story and it's very atmospheric that's what I loved about it I loved the descriptions of nature they're beautiful and um, the ocean obviously played such a big role in this book which I really enjoyed it just permeated the story and yeah it was just highly atmospheric with that you just felt this island and just the constant presence of the ocean like the sound of the waves you know, is constant. It doesn't matter where you are in the island. It's like so integral to these characters and their lives and where they gain sustenance from. And I liked reading about, you know, the fishing that Shinji was doing. And then all the females on this island um, were divers. Um, I forgot that used to be a thing in Japan, um, the female divers. And uh, they would dive for food at a certain time of the year. And so that was cool to read about all of them, you know, and they're working on the sea and just all the descriptions and of the young love and the coming of age and all of that. And so yeah, it was just a very pleasant atmosphere of reading. It was a nice treat for this time of year, you know, it was August and uh, spending a lot of time at the beach myself. So it's nice to read a book set by, set by the sea. And this was lovely. Um, yeah, I hadn't really heard anything about this book beforehand. I just, there's some 20th century Japanese authors I want to read, and Yukio Mishima was on that list, and I, I liked the sound of this one. And I'm really glad I went with this one, because it was really lovely. And his other books sound a little more intense than this one, but I'm excited to read more of his work. So, that was that. So those were all the books I read in August. I didn't read too many because Lamore de Arthur took up so much of my time. It almost took me the whole month to read. But uh, I did enjoy what I read. It was interesting. And I'll talk to you next month with hopefully more books. And if you want to read full-length reviews of any of the books I read, you can find those on Tumblr, Goodreads, of course. I'll link those below. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye!